Hello, and welcome to In Pursuit of Beautiful Dreams, Part 2, Powered Flight. Um, I'm basing most of this design on a Piper Cub J3, as their construction is fairly simple. Um, real ones are made with chromoly tubes, but they're often adapted for model aircraft out of balsa wood. Here I'm going to use redwood. It's quite a large aircraft, so I'm going to scale it down to a half. Two horsepower. Chainsaw two. engines are fairly light. Uh, ten. Okay. I managed to find a fairly two. cheap strimmer engine. I don't know if it works yet though. Here's a spot of material testing. That's from my previous wing on the first episode. I'm going to do all my cutting with an 80 tooth saw blade. They're just fantastic. Most of the cuts need no planing whatsoever. Um, here's a more advanced truss section and it can take most of my weight. The design is fairly basic. It's all in 1 to 12.5, just angles and lines. The whole aircraft is built from a piece of spruce, 20 by 200 by 4000, cut into 3 mil strips. Unfortunately I lost all the footage of manufacturing this fuselage and the wing cores. It's just T-section glued together and wood strips stapled to the sides. Here's the wing cores, which are a laminated truss section, and stapled and gorilla glued again. And providing they're straight ahead of you, they're very, very strong. Here's my foil building guide. I bent a whole bunch of half-cut wood strips and laminated them similarly to the central wing core truss section. It's not a good way of building unless you nail all of these aerofoil sections, and later I did. To be able to do that, I needed a needle drill, so this is the construction of that. Motor, one mil drill bit, ballpoint pen, terminal block, screw, ah, oh, bugger. I've heat bent all of these pieces beforehand. First I used sewing pins for bonding these together, but later switched to upholstery pins for a better bond. And the rest of the construction is fairly simple. It's just Gorilla Glue, pilot hole with a needle drill, and then tacked with an upholstery pin. All right. Here is the engine for this aircraft. I've already cut most of the flange off. And compared to a model aircraft engine, it's like pennies for a Strimmer engine. And it's basically the same thing, except it's got a pull cord. Problem is, to get the tank off, I had to remove the um, crank casing. As a result, I'm going to have to replace all these stupid uh, engine gaskets I've destroyed in the process. It's a bit of a nuisance, but what can you do, eh? The stuff you should know podcast. Really, really good. They're smaller than the hose size, so I can just bung this stuff in. Also good, the Tim Dillon Show, Bill Burr's Monday Morning Podcast, and the Duncan Trussell Family Hour. He has the most incredibly peculiar guest you could possibly imagine and they really help pass the time on a large project. And then we have the carburetor. I suppose there is. That's weird. 
easy enough to get a perfect copy of a gasket. I also replaced the gasket on the carburetor. Let's give it a little air. Now it does run here, but it's, I've basically just flooded the crank casing with fuel, that's all. The elevator fins are retained by two plates with two bolts on each, which allow you to remove both fins for transport. Similarly, the wings are bolted just with a single bolt on each spar at the center, being that the trusses on the wings will supply plenty enough rigidity. I've leveled the wings and I'm lifting both of them by about 10 centimeters in the middle just to give it a little dihedral for stability. I really wanted to give these wings sweep as that would give me rotational stability, but um, the mechanical construction of such would make the whole aircraft take much longer and be much more complicated, so I decided to avoid it. All of the control surfaces are hinged on two plates of 3 mil plywood with a 10 mil copper pipe threaded through the center and zip tied so they're easily removable and yet won't back out in flight. The elevator rudder and ailerons are all controlled by large radio controlled metal gear servos. I've had to extend all of their control horns to compensate for slop in the cables that drive the control surfaces. Control wires run through the core of the wing to a linkage which transfers the motion from one axis of rotation to the other. There is a similar linkage to the ailerons from the center of the body to the root of the wing. This connection is removable through zip ties for transportation. My original landing gear concept was parallel linkages, but in practice it did not prove nearly strong enough or to track straight enough to make it down a runway without crashing. Also, I had overlooked the fact that I had designed the wing trusses to mount to the same point as the landing gear and there really wasn't enough room. We're doing pretty good for weight, but with the lessons I've learned in this construction, I should be able to make the next one even lighter. Unfortunately, just ramming tubes into an old fuel tank doesn't seal well enough as fuel line shrinks after exposed to fuel. It doesn't swell, so I'm replacing it with a polypropylene milk bottle as the plastic is highly resistant to petroleum products. It is also resistant to most corrosive acids, so it makes a good container for your hazardous materials. I'm constructing the revised suspension from old saw blades as they are made of a wonderful spring steel. The spokes of these wheels proved inadequate, so I rebuilt them with plywood spokes. As you can see it wobbled like a jelly, which would be a serious problem with resonance in flight. I built these dampers which are just a simple wood piston in a PVC tube and they proved very effective. I really wanted to cover this aircraft in doped cloth or at least um, proper aircraft covering film iron on, but it proved too expensive just for a prototype. So I'm using this factory defect cellophane, which should do. It's very hard to tape down a piece of plastic as the plastic jumps up with the static to touch the tape making a mess of whatever you're trying to do. I later found out it's much more effective to blue tack down your cellophane, lay tape over the top and then peel up your panel. This construction technique could be made aircraft worthy if you used fiberglass reinforced tape, then you'd have a quite reliable composite. 
I was later recommended ex-military parachutes as they're made from a perfect aircraft material and they're of a very affordable price for the square footage of material. There's at least a good quarter of my lovely plank in wood shavings on the floor. By pure luck, some metric bolts happily connected the carburetor to the rear of the engine, otherwise it would be very loud indeed. I reoriented the pull start for the engine so that I wouldn't cut my hands off in the process of starting it. There is the potential of vibration isolating the engine mount, but I don't think I really need it with just a test aircraft I'll only fly once. The saw blades are too hard to drill so I slot cut them, but later required a mild steel retaining bracket to keep them lengthwise from slipping out. Now it was possible to start this engine just barely, but despite my attempts and cleaning out all of the waxy goo inside of the carburetor, it still wouldn't run properly. So I decided, fuck it, I'll just have a tube of fuel running directly into the carburetor. None of this regulator nonsense. So now the engine is gravity fed with a syringe needle and a little valve to turn it off so it doesn't piss all the fuel on the floor. I also had to hand fit a small retaining bracket for the rear of the propeller to union it with the bolt that holds the flywheel magneto to the engine. And it starts quite adequately now and runs about half choke because of the diameter of the needle. I've ordered a larger propeller from Hobby King as it will need one but the current one is enough to taxi it around the yard, which means propeller and weather dependent, we are go for launch. 